our speakers to you. First of all, we have Professor Lawrence Krauss. <laughs> Professor Krauss. Thank you. Isn't that a very warm Perth welcome? Absolutely, it's great. <laughs> We've seen him on Q&A a couple of times already this year. We've seen him on the Adam Hill tonight, uh, but tonight we have him as himself for you all. <laughs> He's a renowned cosmologist and physicist. He's uh, the Foundation Professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and Director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University. Hailed by Scientific American as a rare public intellectual, Lawrence is also the author of more than 300 sp scientific publications and nine books, including the international bestseller, The Physics of Star Trek, and his most recent bestseller, bestseller entitled A Universe from Nothing, now being translated into 20 languages. Please give uh, Professor Krauss one more round of applause. And in the other corner is Rory Shiner. Please give Rory a big round of applause too. Oh, Ah, uh, a big welcome from the hometown crowd. Rory was, uh, is from Albany and has lived here in Perth. He's lived in Papua New Guinea, Singapore and Sydney. He's studied English, anthropology and theology and is currently completing a PhD through the Ancient History Department at Macquarie University, New South Wales. Rory serves as a pastor at St Matthew's Anglican for their City Church and Uni Church International Congregations and speaks regularly for our host City Bible forum in Perth. Rory writes regularly for Christian magazines and journals on topics including theology, intellectual history and literature. And in April this year he had his first book published, One Forever. Please give Rory another big round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, shall we get into it? Please welcome our very first speaker, Professor Lawrence Krauss. So the purpose tonight is to ask this question, is it reasonable to believe in God? And of course, we don't have to spend a lot of time on that. It's a quick answer, no. Um, and we could just go home or drink. But uh, let me try and um, explain why. Certainly, if, if the numbers mattered, the, the answer is obvious. Apparently not. Because, you know, humans began and everything was a god. The sun, the moon, uh, the wind, the earth, the oceans, every single thing was a god. Everything had intentionality and purpose. And there were many, many gods. In fact, people have estimated at least a thousand different gods over human history, probably many more. Lots of ones you've heard of from Mars, Poseidon, Thor, Amun, Ra, etc, etc, etc. And the interesting thing is, pretty well I imagine everyone here, except for maybe a few people, are atheists regarding all these gods. So it's 999 of them you just don't believe in, so it's just a difference of one at this point. And that's important. There's a reason that people don't believe in all these gods, because we've learned something. The gods have been made unreasonable by the rise of our physical understanding of the universe. Primarily because that physical understanding works. People used to pray for rain, but now when farmers, are, are, when there's a drought, they don't pray for rain anymore. They go and speak to a meteorologist, whether it was on TV or elsewhere. And that's important. That understanding of the universe has done away with all those gods. And the, the, the key point is, is it reasonable to believe in any of them? Now, science has made God at best irrelevant. God used to be an integral part of all physical phenomena, as I say, the earth, wind, sun, etc. And what science has done is continue to banish God to more and more irrelevancies. So in fact, we never talk about God in scientific meetings. So Newton did away, it used to be thought that angels pushed planets around in their orbits around the sun, they were necessary for that. Of course, Newton got rid of that. Darwin demonstrated something very important. The fact that life appears to be designed is an illusion. The fact of special creation for each species can be understood by genetic mutations and natural selection and a distribution in a population. And so he did away with the need for any external special creation of every species. A very, very profound and important discovery which has affected science but also affected our understanding of things. So you don't need God for, for the planets, you don't need God for, for the diversity of life. Now we don't know the origin of life. I expect, by the way, in the lifetime of most people in this room, we will understand the biochemical origin of life. We'll understand how chemistry turns into biology. I think we're fairly close. But the point is everything we know about biochemistry 
Combined with our observations, the fact that there are complex amino acids on, in, out in, the, in, in our solar system, we can measure them, in fact. In fact, the basis, not just of amino acids, but advanced peptides, have all been discovered in interstellar space. And we also know that sunlight and water are ubiquitous. And it seems perfectly plausible that, in fact, processes powered by the energy of the sun, based on these complex amino acids in, a, in an environment that's very different than the environment now plausibly could have created life. It's certainly no obvious evidence that you need any divine spark. Physics has told us you don't need uh, anything supernatural to create matter. Matter can be created and destroyed all the time. We do it in particle physics laboratories all the time. And the amazing thing, and one of the things I wrote, reasons I wrote the last book, is that we've learned that whole universes can arise from nothing just by the laws of physics without any supernatural shenanigans. You just don't need anything supernatural. There's no evidence for anything supernatural. And God, therefore, in, in terms of the physical world, is completely irrelevant. That's why my friend, the physicist uh, uh, Steven Weinberg, says that most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists, because it never comes up. It's not an important question. What we care about is how the universe works, and we're figuring that out. Now, so given that, why hang on to this antiquated notion created by ignorant, in, in the case of the Geo-Christian God, ignorant peasants, Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. Given all the evidence, and given the fact that all the other gods are gone, you might say that, the, given that all those 999 gods are gone, you might say a priori, it's just clear that, that this one that many people in this room happen to hold on to is highly unlikely. That's certainly the case. The other thing I want to point out also is that sometimes people say, well, you know, it's, you can't prove, it's absolutely true that you cannot prove that there's no purpose to the universe. You cannot prove that, the, that some deity didn't create the universe for reasons that, that we don't fathom, although there's no evidence for it whatsoever. But it's not a 50% a priori probability, given the fact that there's no evidence for anything supernatural. There's never been any evidence for anything supernatural. Given that all those gods that were part of, uh, of human civilization have now gone away, in fact, the a priori uh, expectation is the simplest explanation is that there isn't a God. It's an extraordinary claim to argue that there's this invisible, de all-powerful deity without any evidence. I mean, it's the same as saying, well, I can't prove that there aren't leprechauns aren't at the end of the rainbow that disappear when I get to the end of the rainbow. But a reasonable person would say it's highly unlikely, or in fact, so unlikely that in fact it's not the case. Bertrand Russell gave a very good example. I can't prove there's not, a teapot, not some China teapot orbiting Jupiter. I can't, with our telescopes now, prove that there isn't a beautiful China teapot orbiting Jupiter. But any reasonable assumptions based on everything we know about the universe tell us that that's not likely. It's unreasonable to take, have that belief. It's so unreasonable that a reasonable person would not base their actions on that belief. And if, we, if they did, most of us would think they were crazy. The other thing is, if we're going to believe in an invisible man in the sky, which invisible man? Because all of the world's major religions have different in inconsistent views of that invisible man in the sky. And so if you're going to choose that one is absolutely true, which one? Because they're inconsistent with each other. Now the main thing is, and this is really important, is that our current understanding of the universe, based on science, has changed everything. And it's developed since the claims of a, of a god were first formed. We have actually, our, our ideas have changed. It's called learning. It's a good thing. And the, whether or not you believe in some vague deity, what is incredibly important to understand is that the scriptures and the scriptures of all the world's major religions are inconsistent with the evidence of science. They're inconsistent. You can't have your cake and eat it too. They're inconsistent with not just evidence, but reason. And in that sense, they are eminently unreasonable. And the other thing is that, you know, Jesus is nothing new. I mean, he's just as unpleasant as all the other deities, just all the same myths. All this, there's nothing special and new about Jesus that we didn't have before and that we didn't get rid of before very happily. In fact, I would argue that most people already realize this. Most people choose reason over God, including people of faith. Most people who believe in a Judeo-Christian God don't buy other parts of the scriptures they don't like. Most of you 
if you're Christian or Jewish or whatever, or Islam, you, most of you who are reasonable say, you know what, okay, but I don't, you know, I don't believe in, the, in, in Jonah and the whale, and, and I'll just pick up the stuff I don't like, and I'll throw that away, and I'll keep the rest because I want to be Christian. I, you, know, you, don't, you won't worry about the fact that Lot told the you know, people in Sodom, you know, go ahead and rape my daughters because they're just women. You know, the angels are important, so don't rape them. Just rape my daughters because they're just daughters. That's the kind of morals that most people ignore from the Bible. Most people, most Catholics, I would argue, do not believe, including the priests who do it, do not believe that when a priest blesses a wafer, it turns into the body of a first century Jew. It's just, most people just, just do it and don't believe it. The detailed claims and doctrinal claims are ignored because they're ridiculous. Most people don't believe in the virgin birth. I was on a stage once with a bunch of eminent Catholics, some of the eminent Catholic scientists, and, and in fact, a, uh, a representative of the Vatican, the Vatican astronomer, and I asked them on stage, do you, do you believe in the virgin birth? And not one of them would say yes. In fact, a, a really interesting survey, for the first time in England, by the way, it, hardeningly, as happening most of the rest of the Western world, where religion is decreasing monotonically, more people said that they didn't, weren't members of a specific faith than said they were members of a specific faith. For the first time, a majority of people in the census said they weren't. But, but of the Christians who were the dominant people in England, the Richard Dawkins Foundation then did a survey of people and said, why did you check the box Christian? Do you, do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Do you know the books of the Bible? Do you know all this? And the answer was, I put it so people would think I was a nice person. People, most people want to be Christian because it's associated with being nice, not because any of the, of, of the doctrine rel is relevant. Now, the one thing that people seem to hold on to for some reason, and a key factor, is the resurrection. And, and again, the resurrection is nothing new. And when, I, when I write physics papers, people often say to me, well, it's wrong and I did it first, my, many of my colleagues. And in fact, in the case of the resurrection, there's nothing new about Jesus' resurrection. It's happened in almost every creation myth that's been around before that. And specific ones, Dionysus, who was the ancient Greek god of wine, which is someone I can appreciate, um, uh, in fact, not only turned wine into water, but he was born from a virgin mother, and a divine father was resurrected, all of that. Osiris, a key god in, in Egypt, 2,400 years before Jesus was a, uh, walked the earth, apparently, uh, in fact, was, n was not only a key god, but a central part of the r of religion in ancient Egypt was that you could be resurrected along with Osiris, but only if you followed the correct religious prescriptions. Does that sound familiar? The point is that not only is it not new, and not only has it been around forever, there's nothing novel about Jesus' resurrection, there's no evidence. There's no evidence that would pass muster in a science class, much less in a court of law. It's all based on hearsay evidence done years after the fact, and in some cases almost a century after the fact. There's no evidence that uh, that resurrection actually happened in any way that a scientist would, would, would accept. And given that it's never been observationally verified, it's an incredible claim that someone rose from the dead. A priori, it is unreasonable to assume that happens without evidence of that claim. There is no evidence. As Oliver Sacks said in a, a recent book, the point is that it, I'm willing to accept, and even it may be true, that the disciples saw Jesus walking. I know of many people who've had loved ones die, who feel that later they're in the room with them. And I, it's the last thing I'd want to do is to try and dispute with them that fact, because it brings closure and, some, some, and, and, and overcomes the incredible grief. But as Oliver Sacks said, for people who, who experience hallucinations, they're real. Hallucinations are real to the people that experience them. There's no difference for them between a hallucination and reality. But there's no evidence for it. Now, again, to attribute uh, things to uh, my friend Christopher Hitchens, there is a fundamental irrationality with the whole God thing, the whole Judeo-Christian God thing. Because here's what you have to assume. We're asked to believe the following. First, God created the universe 14 billion years ago, except in a number of my states in my country and maybe in Queensland. But uh, uh, then he waited almost 10 billion years before the earth formed. Then he waited another 4 billion years before animals evolved. 
Then he waited over two million years as he watched our hominid ancestors scrape out meager and miserable existences, dying young and living miserable lives without intervening. Then waited another 250,000 years as the first Homo sapiens began to assemble into families and tribes beset by hunger and illness and death. Individuals who are identical to us genetically and therefore presumably have a soul, but who are presumably still suffering through eternity because he chose not to save them. He waited for all that time and then he chose to reveal himself not in an era of video recorders or cameras, but in an area of Iron Age peasants in a society which was beset by myth and superstition and not once since then. Come on. <laughs> and, and the other thing that's fundamentally rational about it is the central premise of, of, of Christianity and Judaism in a sense is as, as Christopher said, we are born sick and commanded to be well. Well, that's not reasonable. Now, the other perhaps evidence in favor that people would argue that supports their belief in, in a God is miracles. But there is no evidence for miracles. In fact, a, a wonderful quote I like from David Hume is that n defining a miracle, saying, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that it's falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which endeavors to establish. That's a fancy way of saying what Carl Sagan said. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And if you're going to argue that a miracle happened, you, which, is, which supersedes all the laws of nature which we observe on a daily basis, you better have some good evidence that we don't. Or, the, or as one of my favorite characters in the X-Files like to say, we have to realize we all want to believe. We all want to believe We're, it's something that, that's natural. When something happens to us, it's special. We don't want to believe it's a coincidence or an accident. And I'll elaborate on that in a second. In fact, that re residual belief in miracles occurs in part because of the discrepancy between the laws of probability and the workings of cognition. So you can have a, a dream, 10,000 dreams over five or 10 years or 12 years, and they're all nonsensical. One day you dream your friend is going to break their leg, the next day they break their arm, and you say, ah, oh, cosmic. But it's, you know, you're not willing to say, well, just, you know, all the other dreams were just stupid. <laughs> we're told by the Catholic Church that Pope John Paul cured a woman in Costa Rica in 2011 after he died. Why? Because she went into a mission. And she prayed. Now, the key, really important difference between science and religion is that in science, and the reason we make progress, as Richard Feynman said, is we try and prove ideas wrong as well as they're right. We have an idea, we like it, and we try and see if there's evidence for it, but we also try and prove it wrong. We don't just try and find evidence to support it and say, see it happen, which is the Catholic Church's way of determining truth. And a good example of this, this cognitive dissonance, if you want, is the miracle of Lourdes. In 18 whatever, 1858, I think the, the uh, apparition of the Virgin Mary appeared in Lourdes, France. And since then, mi literally millions or hundreds of millions of pilgrims have gone to Lourdes, France to bathe in the waters and be cured. In fact, the Catholic Church keeps very good tabs on, those, on the numbers, and there's been over 120 million such pilgrims. Now, there are at present something like 57 cases that they can't explain of, of anomalous cures that, with no obvious reason. Okay? No one ever regenerated an arm or a leg but, you know, they remission from cancer, etc. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, of course, for all these diseases, spontaneous remissions occur in the general population, and particularly the remission of cancer. And if you look at the statistics, you're actually less likely to, to be, have a remission from cancer if you go to Lourdes than if you don't go. But if you go to Lourdes, France, and, and, you're, and you go under remission from cancer, there's no way in hell that I'm going to convince you you didn't have a miracle. That's the problem. Accidents happen. And as like it or not, we have to accept that the fact that they happen. Now, the other thing that makes it unreasonable is the God we've created is a pretty petty God. I mean, you wouldn't, you know, he's a God who said, you know, just for fun, hey, let me kill your son for me. Come on, kill your son. And, or, you know, if, if you're in Islam, you got to prostate five times a day. If you had an ant farm, you made that, if the ants didn't look at you five times a day and bow to you, would you, would you kill them? Okay, or, 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 or condemn them for all eternity? No, a, a, an omnipotent God should be a little less petty. Or even if you're Jesus, you know, you don't say, who talked about hell more than any other character in the Bible, believe in me or I'll condemn you to hell for all eternity. Come on. 
Okay, so let's just skip the rest for you guys. In, in fact, uh, we can get back to that. Rory, I just want to say, Rory, who's a delightful man and I've enjoyed talking to, has pointed out that he's a Christian because his family was Christians. Now, if, you're, if you have reason, it doesn't depend on geography. But if you're born in the US or Australia, you're likely to believe in Jesus. If you're born in India, you're likely to believe in Brahman. If you're born in the Islamic world, you're likely to believe the Quran Cor is the perfect word of God. If it's reasonable, it shouldn't depend upon where you live. That's the key point. And I think I'm going to skip morality because maybe we'll have a chance to talk about morality. Um, and let me just get to the end, but except for the fact that, of course, those who say morality is uh, religion has hijacked morality, and, and in fact, no one would want the morality of the Old Testament or the New Testament, I would argue, because it's wrong and immoral. And in fact, all of you have your morals based on reason and not God. If you didn't believe in God, you wouldn't go out and kill your neighbor tomorrow. Okay, let's hope that, let's hope that I'm, yeah, I'm going to skip fine-tuning and then I'm on my concluding paragraph. So, the summary. The key point is, by replacing God with reason and empirical inquiry, Science provides gifts in return. The universal invitation to question anyone's claims and the universal requirement to exercise due diligence and duty of care to substantiate those claims. First, you want to test your ideas against external reality, check for internal consistency, then check again, and then act rationally, not irrationally. A belief in God doesn't satisfy any of these criteria. And my purpose in being here tonight is not to trash God because I don't give it I don't care about God. My purpose is to encourage you to use these wonderful tools to help make the universe and the world in the 21st century a better place. Thank you very much. Uh, however, in agreeing uh, to be Dr. Krauss's interlocutor, interlocutor uh, this evening, I comfort myself with the memory of the late and very great Christopher Hitchens. Uh, when Hitchens published his book, God is Not Great, he insisted to his publishers that they not send him to the north and east, to Boston and New York, where he would receive a ready reception, but that he'd be sent to the south and to the Midwest, where people actually believed in God. And uh, Christopher Hitchens, to his eternal credit, promiscuously debated pastors, apologists and church workers, respectfully, but with no holds barred. And I comfort myself with the thought that tonight is a footnote to that noble tradition. So thank you. Uh, now, in order to avoid that YouTube uh, atheist comedy channel, I don't intend to uh, pose tonight as a philosopher or to challenge uh, Professor Krauss's science, which at any rate would have me looking like watching your dad dance at your 21st. Uh, what I can do, I think, is offer an account as a local pastor uh, from the trenches of Christian faith and church life. Uh, the churches are where faith is incubated and built. They are where we hear our sermons, share in communion, visit orphans and widows, baptise and pray. And if I can give a reasonable account to sceptical people of how we have come to our beliefs about God, then that's a service I can gladly offer. The topic tonight is, is it reasonable to believe there is a God? And I think we probably all agree, I tr trust we agree, that if belief in God is unreasonable, it ought to be abandoned. Or, at the very least, if belief in God is unreasonable, then you should at least accept that to be a private and eccentric thought. Uh, rather than a thing that is to be public and relevant to other people's lives. Uh, now, of course, as, uh, as Lawrence has said, uh, the origins of our beliefs are part of a complex web of tradition, geography, genetics, and biology. I was born in a Christian family. Uh, Lawrence was born at, the, uh, at a great stage in the, uh, in the world of science and Western tradition of thought. And so I think as reflective beings, we don't need to be able to account for the origins of our beliefs, which are often obscure, cultural, and genetic. But I think as reasonable adults, we need to be able to account for why we still believe in the things that we perhaps inherited from childhood. Is it still reasonable to believe there is a God? And I wish to address three issues on this topic. Firstly, as Lawrence has said, which God? Uh, you notice tonight that the, the, the title includes the indefinite article. Is it reasonable to believe that there is a God? To which a reasonable question is, which one? As atheists uh, regularly remind us, as we've done tonight, there are thousands of gods that none of us believe in. Mars, Aphrodite, and the flying spaghetti monster have no temples and receive no prayers from us. Uh, as the joke we've had tonight, atheists beat us by one when it comes to atheism. 
Now, I think the joke does contain a, a quite a deep insight. As I'm sure many of you will be aware, the early Christians were called atheists. Uh, they, and they were called atheists because they were sceptical regarding the claims of the emperor to divinity. They were sceptical regarding the existence of the pagan gods. And they appeared to have no cult, no obvious worship. Part of the DNA of being a Christian is scepticism, atheism, about the existence of those gods. Now, however, I think that joke, which as I say, I stand with, uh, does contain within it a, an epistemic and a categorical confusion. Uh, the easy dismissal that there are thousands of gods, I think, does confuse two quite distinct things. Uh, so the gods refers to a plurality of divine beings who are alleged to inhabit our cosmos, whereas God refers to the transcendent source of all things, of all beings, and lies outside the cosmos. I don't think this is special pleading on the part of Christians. It's an unremarkable distinction that, according to David Bentley Hart, goes back to the, in the Greek tradition at least as far as the Xenophanes, and it's one that's readily understood in Islam, Judaism, forms of Hinduism, and Deism. The gods belong to nature. The gods are part of this cosmos. There are stories of how they were born, who their parents were. There's even accounts of their death. The so-called creation myths of the gods are, in fact, uh, myths about how the present order came into being. Uh, none of the myths of antiquity account for creation from nothing. They are distinct beings rather than being itself. How would you discover a reasonable way to believe in the gods, given that they're distinct beings? I think you'd have to either go an empirical route, you'd have to find them and discover some method by which they could be uncovered, or you'd have to propose a reason why they're believed in, even though they're not there. And there are many good reasons. Feuerbach would say that they are human hopes projected onto the heavens. Marx would say that they are instruments of control. Or Christians would say they are a form of broken worship, that is, idolatry. My point is this. The way in which you would assess the existence of Hermes or Poseidon or the flying spaghetti monster would be very different from the way you would assess the existence of God. It's like Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, Shakespeare creates a world populated with characters, Ophelia, Claudius, Horatio, and Hamlet himself. And the gods are like those characters. They inhabit that world. But when Christians speak of God, they, they speak of a character not in our world. He's not part of the drama. No, uh, if the world is Hamlet, then God is Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is nowhere present in Hamlet. And yet, by Shakespeare, everything that happens in Hamlet lives and moves and has its being. I realise none of that is an argument for God, but it's a clarity about what we're talking about. How would you go about believing in God, in the God? Well, I think there are two paths to belief in God, which would be reason and revelation. Uh, the path of reason uh, contains with it the famous arguments for the existence of God, the teleological argument, the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, and so on. Three quick comments. Firstly, they're generic uh, rather than specifically Christian. They're in Aristotle and Islam and Judaism. Whatever you think of them, they're not the products of a provincial religious culture. And secondly, in the Christian tradition, they have not been lent on as incontrovertible reasons to believe, but as cases of faith-seeking understanding. And thirdly, I simply note that they have experienced something of a revival in the academy with philosophers such as Alvin Plantinger of Notre Dame, Keith Ward of Oxford and Richard Swinburne of Cambridge, all providing compelling contemporary accounts of them as valid arguments. Now, personally, I think they do generally wave their arms in a Godward direction. And I still vividly remember the half hour when I comprehended the force of the ontological argument as I sat in a library in Sydney. But for me and for many Christians, I think I stand rather with C.S. Lewis when C.S. Lewis said he believes in God as he believes in the sun, not so much because he looks at the sun, but because by the light of the sun he looks at everything. And for many Christians, we reason this way. To be a Christian is to see all the clues come together and to, and to see God as apprehending the whole, as being comprehended by that hypothesis. Our sense of justice and morality, our ability to reason itself and consciousness, our sense of beauty and transcendence and so on. Note, I do not say that these things are unavailable to atheists. Of course they are. But our argument is that God provides a compelling account of the experiences that we share. But finally, and to be honest, 
Most Christians believe in God because we believe that God has revealed himself. I realise appealing to revelation amongst sceptics can be groan-inducing, but I think it's unavoidable if God is as we describe him. You see, if God is to our universe as Shakespeare is to Hamlet, then revelation is necessary. Uh, Could Ophelia conclude anything about the nature and character of Shakespeare from her position in Hamlet? No, Hamlet, like our universe, makes a good deal of sense on its own. And just as the literary critic doesn't need to keep invoking the Shakespeare hypothesis to make sense of the drama, the scientist does not need to keep invoking the God hypothesis to make sense of her discoveries. And for Christians, this is not a bug, it's a feature. We have a universe that is gloriously open to empirical investigation. And any Christian here should wait with bated breath for Dr. Krauss's next book, as we discover good and gorgeous things about our world. But for Ophelia to know Shakespeare, to stretch the analogy to breaking point, is for Shakespeare to write himself into the play. And that's the specific Christian claim. Christians claim that the transcendent God of creation has, for reasons of love, written himself into the unfinished drama of human experience. The act of revelation centres on the man, Jesus of Nazareth, born in Palestine at the time of Herod the Great, crucified under Pontius Pilate, and who Christians believe was raised to new life in the wee small hours of a Sunday morning in a graveyard on the edge of Jerusalem. At the point of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, Christianity puts its head on the chopping block of history. I think it's unlike the stories of the dying and rising gods of antiquity. All those stories come from outside Judaism, but Judaism has no tradition of such stories, and that is the tradition in which Jesus was firmly embedded. And those dying and rising gods were indexed against the seasons and fertility and crops, and they were precisely gods and not men, and they never rose in their body, but to a spiritual existence. Their dying and rising happened in the dream time, in in prehistory. I think if you asked a pagan from antiquity, on what particular date did your God die and rise to life again? They would look at you strangely and say, you don't really get myth, do you? But Jesus, by contrast, was crucified under Pontius Pilate in our history. Not in the dream time, but under the Roman, the, the high Roman Empire. It is alleged that he rose to life in April early in the morning on a Sunday. It's a claim of history. It's not a scientific uh, hypothesis in the sense that it can be observed and tested and repeated and then put into peer-reviewed journals. No, the claim that, that no Christian claims that under the right conditions, a 33-year-old dead Jewish body will, in a sufficiently cold and dark tomb, come back to life. Christians are not claiming that something happens but that something happened. And whether on historical grounds, uh, what is, uh, whether it happened or not, needs to be affirmed or denied on historical grounds. Written evidence, conjecture, probability, testimony, and historical hypothesis. The world of New Testament scholarship is like the world of science, a competitive and critical discipline. It's a world populated by Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, and agnostics, and uh, theories that are contrary to Christian dogma and tradition are the stuff on which many PhDs and academic careers are built. Have I done my time? Three minutes, great. And in that critical world, in that competitive world of New Testament scholarship, very few people treat the resurrection of Jesus as a myth. Now, don't misunderstand me. Very many of them do not believe it happened. But very few think myth is the category by which it can be assessed. And very many New Testament scholars, cynical, sceptical, and atheist scholars included, believe that the two stable facts with which any historical uh, hypothesis must reckon is an empty tomb and the resurrection appearances. Neither of those by themselves are remarkable. Empty tombs and and robbed graves are no great indication of God. And as, uh, as Lawrence has said, neither are grieving people purporting to see uh, the one that they mourn. But the Christian claim is that those two things come together. That an unexpectedly empty tomb is discovered and a risen Jesus is encountered. 
And for my money, uh, as you look at the evidence, the nature, the spread, and, and, and the, the closeness to the time of that evidence, I think there are compelling reasons to take seriously the Christian claim that Jesus rose from the dead. Not that that happens, but that it happened. However, I do think there's one very good reason to disbelieve in the resurrection of Jesus, that there's no God to do it. But that is precisely the point under discussion. And I do think that the resurrection of Jesus could bring someone rationally and reasonably toward belief in God. Thank you.